Many people will probably judge us callous as well as mad for thinking about the northward tunnel and the abyss so soon after our sombre discovery, and I am not prepared to say that we would have immediately revived such thoughts but for a specific circumstance which broke in upon us and set up a whole new train of speculations. We had replaced the tarpaulin over poor Gedney and were standing in a kind of mute bewilderment when the sounds finally reached our consciousness. The first sounds we had heard since descending out of the open where the mountain wind whined faintly from its unearthly heights. Well known and mundane though they were, their presence in this remote world of death was more unexpected and unnerving than any grotesque or fabulous tones could possibly have been, since they gave a fresh upsetting to all our notions of cosmic harmony. Had it been some trace of that bizarre musical piping over a wide range which Lake's dissection report had led us to expect in those others, and which, indeed, our overwrought fancies had been reading into every wind-howl we had heard since coming on the camp horror, it would have had a kind of hellish congruity with the eon-dead region around us. A voice from other epochs belongs in a graveyard of other epochs. As it was, however, the noise shattered all our profoundly seated adjustments, all our tacit acceptance of the inner Antarctic as a waste utterly and irrevocably void of every vestige of normal life. What we heard was not the fabulous note of any buried blasphemy of Elder Earth, from whose supernatural toughness an age-denied polar sun had evoked a monstrous response. Indeed, it was a thing so mockingly normal and so unerringly familiarised by our sea days off Victoria Land and our camp days at McMurdo Sound that we shuddered to think of it here, where such things ought not to be. To be brief, it was simply the raucous squawking of a penguin. The muffled sound floated from subglacial recesses nearly opposite to the corridor whence we had come, regions manifestly in the direction of that other tunnel to the vast abyss. The presence of a living water-bird in such a direction, in a world whose surface was one of age-long and uniform lifelessness, could lead to only one conclusion. Hence our first thought was to verify the objective reality of the sound. It was indeed repeated, and seemed at times to come from more than one throat. Seeking its source, we entered an archway from which much debris had been cleared, resuming our trailblazing with an added paper supply taken with curious repugnance from one of the tarpaulin bundles on the sledges when we left daylight behind. As the glaciated floor gave place to a litter of detritus, we plainly discerned some curious, dragging tracks, and once Danforth found a distinct print of a sort whose description would be only too superfluous. The course indicated by the penguin cries was precisely what our map and compass prescribed as an approach to the more northerly tunnel mouth and we were glad to find that a bridgeless thoroughfare on the ground and basement levels seemed open. The tunnel, according to the chart, ought to start from the basement of a large pyramidal structure which we seemed vaguely to recall from our aerial survey as remarkably well preserved. Along our path the single torch showed a customary profusion of carvings, but we did not pause to examine any of these. Suddenly a bulky white shape loomed up ahead of us, and we flashed on the second torch. It is odd how wholly this new quest had turned our minds from earlier fears of what might lurk near. Those other ones, having left their supplies in the great circular place, must have planned to return after their scouting trip toward or into the abyss. Yet we had now discarded all caution concerning them as completely as if they had never existed. This white, waddling thing was fully six feet high, yet we seemed to realize at once that it was not one of those others. They were larger and dark, and according to the sculptures, their motion over land surfaces was a swift, assured matter, despite the queerness of their seaborne tentacle equipment. But to say that the white thing did not profoundly frighten us would be vain. We were indeed clutched, for an instant, by primitive dread almost sharper than the worst of our reasoned fears regarding those others. Then came a flash of anticlimax as the white shape sidled into a lateral archway to our left to join two others of its kind which had summoned it in raucous tones. For it was only a penguin, albeit of a huge, unknown species larger than the greatest of the known king penguins, and monstrous in its combined albinism and virtual eyelessness. When we had followed the thing into the archway and turned both our torches on the indifferent and unheeding group of three, 
we saw that they were all eyeless albinos of the same unknown and gigantic species. Their size reminded us of some of the archaic penguins depicted in the old one's sculptures, and it did not take us long to conclude that they were descended from the same stock, undoubtedly surviving through a retreat to some warmer in a region whose perpetual blackness had destroyed their pigmentation and atrophied their eyes to mere useless slits. That their present habitat was the vast abyss we sought was not for a moment to be doubted, and this evidence of the gulf's continued warmth and habitability filled us with the most curious and subtly perturbing fancies. We wondered, too, what had caused these three birds to venture out of their usual domain. The state and silence of the great dead city made it clear that it had at no time been an habitual seasonal rookery, whilst the manifest indifference of the trio to our presence made it seem odd that any passing party of those others should have startled them. Was it possible that those others had taken some aggressive action or tried to increase their meat supply? We doubted whether that pungent odour which the dogs had hated could cause an equal antipathy in these penguins, since their ancestors had obviously lived on excellent terms with the old ones, an amicable relationship which must have survived in the abyss below as long as any of the old ones remained. Regretting, in a flare-up of the old spirit of pure science, that we could not photograph these anomalous creatures, we shortly left them to their squawking and pushed on toward the abyss whose openness was now so positively proved to us, and whose exact direction occasional penguin tracks made clear. Not long afterward, a steep descent in a long, low, doorless, and peculiarly sculptureless corridor led us to believe that we were approaching the tunnel mouth at last. We had passed two more penguins, and heard others immediately ahead. Then the corridor ended in a prodigious open space which made us gasp involuntarily. A perfect, inverted hemisphere, obviously deep underground, fully a hundred feet in diameter and fifty feet high, with low archways opening around all parts of the circumference but one, and that one yawning cavernously with a black arched aperture which broke the symmetry of the vault to a height of nearly fifteen feet. It was the entrance to the great abyss. In this vast hemisphere, whose concave roof was impressively though decadently carved to a likeness of the primordial celestial dome, a few albino penguins waddled. Aliens there, but indifferent and unseeing. The black tunnel yawned indefinitely off at a steep descending grade, its aperture adorned with grotesquely chiselled jams and lintel. From that cryptical mouth we fancied a current of slightly warmer air, and perhaps even a suspicion of vapour proceeded and we wondered what living entities other than penguins, the limitless void below, and the contiguous honeycombings of the land and the Titan mountains might conceal. We wondered, too, whether the trace of mountain-top smoke at first suspected by poor Lake, as well as the odd haze we had ourselves perceived around the rampart-crowned peak, might not be caused by the tortuous channel rising of some such vapour from the unfathomed regions of Earth's core. Entering the tunnel, we saw that its outline was, at least at the start, about fifteen feet each way, sides, floor, and arched roof composed of the usual megalithic masonry. The sides were sparsely decorated with cartouches of conventional designs in a late, decadent style, and all the construction and carving were marvellously well preserved. The floor was quite clear, except for slight detritus bearing outgoing penguin tracks and the inward tracks of these others. The farther one advanced, the warmer it became, so that we were soon unbuttoning our heavy garments. We wondered whether there were any actually igneous manifestations below, and whether the waters of that sunless sea were hot. After a short distance, the masonry gave place to solid rock, though the tunnel kept the same proportions and presented the same aspect of carved regularity. Occasionally, its varying grade became so steep that grooves were cut in the floor. Several times we noted the mouths of small lateral galleries not recorded in our diagrams, none of them such as to complicate the problem of our return, and all of them welcome as possible refuges in case we met unwelcome entities on their way back from the abyss. The nameless scent of such things was very distinct. Doubtless it was suicidally foolish to venture into that tunnel under the known conditions, but the lure of the unplumbed is stronger in certain persons than most suspect. Indeed, it was just such a lure which had brought us to this unearthly polar waste in the first place. We saw several penguins as we passed along, and speculated on the distance we would have to traverse. The carvings had led us to expect a steep downhill walk of about a mile to the abyss. 
but our previous wanderings had shown us that matters of scale were not wholly to be depended on. After about a quarter of a mile, that nameless scent became greatly accentuated, and we kept very careful track of the various lateral openings we passed. There was no visible vapour as at the mouth, but this was doubtless due to the lack of contrasting cooler air. The temperature was rapidly ascending, and we were not surprised to come upon a careless heap of material shudderingly familiar to us. It was composed of furs and tent cloth taken from Laik's camp, and we did not pause to study the bizarre forms into which the fabrics had been slashed. Slightly beyond this point we noticed a decided increase in the size and number of the side galleries, and concluded that the densely honeycombed region beneath the higher foothills must now have been reached. The nameless scent was now curiously mixed with another and scarcely less offensive odour, of what nature we could not guess. But we thought of decaying organisms and perhaps unknown subterranean fungi. Then came a startling expansion of the tunnel for which the carvings had not prepared us, a broadening and rising into a lofty, natural-looking elliptical cavern with a level floor, some seventy-five feet long and fifty broad, and with many immense side passages leading away into cryptical darkness. Though this cavern was natural in appearance, an inspection with both torches suggested that it had been formed by the artificial destruction of several walls between adjacent honeycombings. The walls were rough, and the high, vaulted roof was thick with stalactites, but the solid rock floor had been smoothed off, and was free from all debris, detritus, or even dust to a positively abnormal extent. Except for the avenue through which we had come, this was true of the floors of all the great galleries opening off from it, and the singularity of the condition was such as to set us vainly puzzling. The curious new feature which had supplemented the nameless scent was excessively pungent here, so much so that it destroyed all trace of the other. Something about this whole place, with its polished and almost glistening floor, struck us as more vaguely baffling and horrible than any of the monstrous things we had previously encountered. The regularity of the passage immediately ahead, as well as the larger proportion of penguin droppings there, prevented all confusion as to the right course amidst this plethora of equally great cave-mouths. Nevertheless, we resolved to resume our paper trailblazing if any further complexity should develop, for dust-tracks, of course, could no longer be expected. Upon resuming our direct progress we cast a beam of torchlight over the tunnel walls, and stopped short in amazement at the supremely radical change which had come over the carvings in this part of the passage. We realised, of course, the great decadence of the old one's sculpture at the time of the tunnelling, and had indeed noticed the inferior workmanship of the arabesques in the stretches behind us. But now, in this deeper section beyond the cavern, there was a sudden difference wholly transcending explanation a difference in basic nature as well as in mere quality, and involving so profound and calamitous a degradation of skill that nothing in the hitherto observed rate of decline could have led one to expect it. This new and degenerate work was coarse, bold, and wholly lacking in delicacy of detail. It was countersunk with exaggerated depth in bands, following the same general line as the sparse cartouches of the earlier sections but the height of the reliefs did not reach the level of the general surface. Danforth had the idea that it was a second carving, a sort of palimpsest formed after the obliteration of a previous design. In nature it was wholly decorative and conventional, and consisted of crude spirals and angles roughly following the quintile mathematical tradition of the old ones, yet seeming more like a parody than a perpetuation of that tradition. We could not get it out of our minds that some subtly but profoundly alien element had been added to the aesthetic feeling behind the technique. An alien element, Danforth guessed, that was responsible for the laborious substitution. It was like, yet disturbingly unlike, what we had come to recognize as the old one's art, and I was persistently reminded of such hybrid things as the ungainly palmarine sculptures fashioned in the Roman manner. That others had recently noticed this belt of carving was hinted by the presence of a used flashlight battery on the floor in front of one of the most characteristic cartouches. Since we could not afford to spend any considerable time in study, we resumed our advance after a cursory look, though frequently casting beams over the walls to see if any further decorative changes developed. Nothing of the sort was perceived, 
though the carvings were in places rather sparse because of the numerous mouths of smooth-floored lateral tunnels. We saw and heard fewer penguins, but thought we caught a vague suspicion of an infinitely distant chorus of them somewhere deep within the earth. The new and inexplicable odour was abominably strong, and we could detect scarcely a sign of that other nameless scent. Puffs of visible vapour ahead bespoke increasing contrasts in temperature, and the relative nearness of the sunless sea-cliffs of the great abyss. Then, quite unexpectedly, we saw certain obstructions on the polished floor ahead, obstructions which were quite definitely not penguins, and turned on our second torch after making sure that the objects were quite stationary. Part 11 Still another time have I come to a place where it is very difficult to proceed. I ought to be hardened by this stage, but there are some experiences and intimations which scar too deeply to permit of healing, and leave only such an added sensitiveness that memory re-inspires all the original horror. We saw, as I have said, certain obstructions on the polished floor ahead, and I may add that our nostrils were assailed almost simultaneously by a very curious intensification of the strange prevailing feature, now quite plainly mixed with the nameless stench of those others which had gone before. The light of the second torch left no doubt of what the obstructions were, and we dared approach them only because we could see, even from a distance, that they were quite as past all harming power as had been the six similar specimens unearthed from the monstrous star-mounded graves at Poor Lake's camp. They were indeed as lacking in completeness as most of those we had unearthed, though it grew plain from the thick, dark green pool gathering around them that their incompleteness was of infinitely greater recency. There seemed to be only four of them, whereas Lake's bulletins would have suggested no less than eight as forming the group which had preceded us. To find them in this state was wholly unexpected, and we wondered what sort of monstrous struggle had occurred down here in the dark. Penguins, attacked in a body, retaliate savagely with their beaks, and our ears now made certain the existence of a rookery far beyond. Had those others disturbed such a place and aroused murderous pursuit? The obstructions did not suggest it, for penguins' beaks against the tough tissues Lake had dissected could hardly account for the terrible damage our approaching glance was beginning to make out. Besides, the huge blind birds we had seen appeared to be singularly peaceful. Had there, then, been a struggle amongst those others, and were the absent four responsible? If so, where were they? Were they close at hand and likely to form an immediate menace to us? We glanced anxiously at some of the smooth-floored lateral passages as we continued our slow and frankly reluctant approach. Whatever the conflict was, it had clearly been that which had frightened the penguins into their unaccustomed wandering. It must then have arisen near that faintly heard rookery in the incalculable gulf beyond, since there were no signs that any birds had normally dwelt here. Perhaps, we reflected, there had been a hideous running fight with the weaker party seeking to get back to the cached sledges when their pursuers finished them. One could picture the demoniac fray between namelessly monstrous entities as it surged out of the black abyss, with great clouds of frantic penguins squawking and scurrying ahead. I say that we approached those sprawling and incomplete obstructions slowly and reluctantly. Would to heaven we had never approached them at all, but had run back at top speed out of that blasphemous tunnel with the greasily smooth floors and the degenerate mules aping and mocking the things they had superseded, run back before we had seen what we did see, and before our minds were burned with something which will never let us breathe easily again. Both of our torches were turned on the prostrate objects, so that we soon realised the dominant factor in their incompleteness. Mauled, compressed, twisted and ruptured as they were, their chief common injury was total decapitation. From each one the tentacled starfish head had been removed, and as we drew near we saw that the manner of removal looked more like some hellish tearing or suction than like any ordinary form of cleavage. Their noisome dark green ichor formed a large spreading pool, but its stench was half overshadowed by the newer and stranger stench here more pungent than at any other point along our route. Only when we had come very close to the sprawling obstructions could we trace that second, unexplainable feature to any immediate source. And the instant we did so, Danforth, remembering certain very vivid sculptures of the old one's history in the Permian Age, one hundred and fifty million years ago, 
gave vent to a nerve-tortured cry which echoed hysterically through that vaulted and archaic passage with the evil palimpsest carvings. I came only just short of echoing his cry myself, for I had seen those primal sculptures too, and had shudderingly admired the way the nameless artist had suggested that hideous slime coating found on certain incomplete and prostrate old ones. Those whom the frightful Shoggoths had characteristically slain and sucked to a ghastly headlessness in the great war of resubjugation. They were infamous, nightmare sculptures even when telling of age-old bygone things. For Shoggoths and their work ought not to be seen by human beings or portrayed by any beings. The mad author of the Necronomicon had nervously tried to swear that none had been bred on this planet, and that only drug dreamers had even conceived them. Formless protoplasm able to mock and reflect all forms and organs and processes, viscous agglutinations of bubbling cells, rubbery fifteen-foot spheroids infinitely plastic and ductile, slaves of suggestion, builders of cities, more and more sullen, more and more intelligent, more and more amphibious, more and more imitative. Great God! What madness made even those blasphemous old ones willing to use and carve such things? And now, when Danforth and I saw the freshly glistening and reflectively iridescent black slime which clung thickly to those headless bodies, and stank obscenely with that new, unknown odour whose cause only a diseased fancy could envisage, clung to those bodies and sparkled less voluminously on a smooth part of the accursedly resculptured wall in a series of grouped dots, we understood the quality of cosmic fear to its uttermost depths. It was not fear of those four missing others, for all too well did we suspect they would do no harm again. Poor devils! After all, they were not evil things of their kind. They were just the men of another age and another order of being. Nature had played a hellish jest on them, as it will on any others that human madness, callousness or cruelty may hereafter dig up in that hideously dead or sleeping polar waste and this was their tragic homecoming. They had not been even savages, for what indeed had they done? That awful awakening in the cold of an unknown epoch, perhaps an attack by the furry, frantically barking quadrupeds, and a day's defence against them and the equally frantic white simians with the queer wrappings and paraphernalia. Poor Lake! Poor Gedney and poor old ones! Scientists to the last! What had they done that we would not have done in their place? God, what intelligence and persistence! What a facing of the incredible! Just as those carven kinsmen and forebears had faced things only a little less incredible. Radiates, vegetables, monstrosities, star-spawn, whatever they had been, they were men. They had crossed the icy peaks on whose templed slopes they had once worshipped and roamed among the tree-ferns. They had found their dead city brooding under its curse, and had read its carven latter days as we had done. They had tried to reach their living fellows in fabled depths of blackness they had never seen, and what had they found? All this flashed in unison through the thoughts of Danforth and me as we looked from those headless, slime-coated shapes to the loathsome palimpsest sculptures and the diabolical dot-groups of fresh slime on the wall beside them. Looked and understood what must have triumphed and survived down there in the cyclopean water of that nighted penguin-fringed abyss, whence even now a sinister curling mist had begun to belch pallidly, as if in answer to Danforth's hysterical scream. 